So welcome everyone to the course, The Buddhist Path of Awakening. And um, <clears throat> we are working our way through the three volumes of the profound treasury of the ocean of Dharma. For 15 years, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche would take his students away each year for about three months, uh, usually 150 to 250 students, and they would go off on retreat together. And there would be periods of pure practice, and then there would be periods of study when practice was mixed with study. And during those study periods, he would lecture in the evenings. Those lectures over the course of 15 years have been collected and digested into these three volumes that we are studying. Um, each volume corresponds to a different phase of the seminary program that he did each year. They were divided into the three vehicles or yanas of Tibetan Buddhism. The first is the Hinayana, the so-called lesser vehicle, which he preferred to call the foundational vehicle. The second is the Mahayana, and that's what we are studying now. We're in volume two, which covers the Mahayana. And the third is the Vajrayana, the adamantine or indestructible or tantric vehicle. And we, that's in the third volume, which we have not begun yet. We are waking our way through volume two. We are up to the chapter um, on um, <laughs> Shunyata. And we'll start tonight. Michael is going to lead off. So the chapter we read is uh, titled Prajna. And just to frame what we're talking about a little bit, the um, Prajna really refers to the seeing, but especially the knowing quality of awareness that we experience. And as Trungpa Rinpoche has said in previous talks, uh, it develops out of shamatha vipassana practice. But it's important to remember that all of the paramitas, generosity, discipline, patience, exertion, and meditation are, are involved with or entail shamatha vipassana practice. So it's all of this, all of the shamatha vipassana practice, including the five paramitas that bring us to the point of um, prajna. So on the one hand, prajna is inherent in us. It's not something that we need to create or that we're lacking, but it is something that needs cultivation. It's something that um, will grow under if we work with it and allow ourselves to work with ourselves as well through the practice of meditation, as well as through study. But it's something that we experience even with a little bit of meditation practice, even with a little bit of meditation practice, we know the difference in our experience of what it means to be present as opposed to what it means to be distracted. There's a, a very distinct difference that we know just intuitively, experientially. Um, and this continues to develop as we work with meditation practice. We come to see, for instance, that um, our minds are changeable, that our moods, feelings, thoughts change. And so we come to recognize more and more the truth of impermanence. We come to know impermanence, actually, in terms of our actual experience. We come to understand something about what it means to identify with thoughts, to actually believe that we are our thoughts, and come to know that, in fact, we don't need to be that way, that we um, are not our thoughts, that we don't need to believe everything that we think. Um, so Prajna sees that we could let go of our agenda and instead be available to someone else which is one of the things we talked about earlier in terms of Mahayana practice. It's that knowing quality, just know on the spot without, um, without necessarily anything further. And in that sense, you could think that this knowing or prajna quality could really be a verb as much as a noun, that it's something we experience, something that we can rest in, something that we can recognize in our experience of awareness. And prajna also includes a sense of openness and inquisitiveness. Uh, you know what you don't know. 
and you were curious about growing further, learning further. And all of this is, uh, is prajna, or what's also called discriminating awareness wisdom. So Trungpa Rinpoche begins the chapter by saying that prajna paramita is the clear perception of the phenomenal world, and that the closest word to prajna in English he felt was knowledge, which actually is jana part of prajna, but pra indicates that it's actually superior knowledge. And as we go through the chapter, we'll see that in fact, there are different levels of prajna, which sometimes might be a little confusing, but in, on the level of the six paramita, prajna paramita, it's superior knowledge or superior seeing. He says that prajna transcends <clears throat> technical knowledge alone, although it also includes that, but it transcends technical knowledge alone or the kinds of learning you go to school to cultivate. And more particularly, because in the Mahayana, we're trying to help others, that rather than, rather than developing the individual salvation of the Hinayana, it's an altogether different level of prajna at this point. He says it's like the difference between going to nursing school to learn medical theory and actually practicing that theory by working with others. So we're developing prajna again with the bodhicitta intention of um, working for the benefit of all sentient beings. The Tibetan word shara translates as best knowledge, supreme knowing, the best of cognitive mind, best of cognition, and the best of knowledge altogether. Trungpa Rinpoche gives several definitions there. And he says that the emphasis of shara is on both the knowledge itself and the state of mind of the knower. So again, it's very much connected with very much in the experience of being present in meditation practice, recognizing our awareness and um, being able to be stabilized in the awareness, which is uh, part of the development we go through with the previous paramita meditation where thought process becomes stabilized. Shamatha, Vipassana come together so that um, with Vipassana we're aware but the shamatha aspect is we don't stray from that. We don't wander from our awareness so that thought processes become stabilized. And out of this, we have the um, superior knowledge, the best of cognition, um, the best of cognitive mind, the supreme knowing that Trungpa Rinpoche talks about. He says that ordinarily knowledge refers to being knowledgeable about something or other. You collect information and try to understand that information and store it up in memory. But in this case of Sharap, we don't qualify or give credentials to knowledge. In other words, we're not um, relating to our experience, our uh, intelligence, our awareness in a materialistic way. We're not trying to hold on or build up anything, but rather it's simply knowledge. It's simply what we experience, what we see, what we know on the spot. Sharap, he says, is unconditional knowledge where knowingness takes, can take place at a very high level. It is not knowing this or that, but simply knowing, which connects with the quality of wakefulness. So again, we're talking about, as he said earlier, the state of mind of the knower. We're talking about what we might, we might ourselves experience in a moment of prajna. So the sharap is very directly connected with waking up, being present, not being lost in dream or distraction, or preoccupation. He says that sharap is not described uh, in terms of technicalities or information, but in terms of simply being there with knowledge, simply being awake, simply being present. Sharap is the state of knowingness, the state of wakefulness. He also says that sharap refers to the subject and object coming together. So again, there's a sense of non-duality or dissolving of twofold ego, which we'll talk about later. But basically, you possess share up when you have a mind that is capable of learning. In other words, a mind that's open, available, um, not filled with preconception and habitual pattern. So you have a mind, you possess share up when you have a mind that's capable of learning. But the various subjects you learn about are also known as share up. It includes both the knowledge and the person who looks at knowledge. And he compares it to being like the loop or stringed instrument, and the hearing consciousness, the sense object and the sense consciousness put together and you hear music between the two. So that 
In other words, there's a sense of awareness that as a continuous thread through our experience. And he then says that Sharap is very fresh and very much on the spot, which I think again refers back to his statement that it refers as well to the state of mind of the knower, a state of being where we're awake, present, available, so that whatever arises is fresh and not colored by any kind of preconception. He says in describing Sharap as the best of cognitive mind, cognition means being able to see rather than being able to perceive. The word perceive might have the sense of banking things in memory, but cognition has the quality of simply seeing things without storing. The senses don't have to be captured and restored. So again, we're talking about not taking a materialistic or a grasping approach to our experience, but simply allowing ourselves to be with our experience in the moment and not getting caught up in any kind of preconception, any kind of grasping. Fundamentally, he says, the sense processes could come and go like anything else in our state of being. He says, capturing is what our parents told us to do and is how we've been educated, but it's a bad habit. So here again, where he's talking about the habitual patterns that we have, where we fixate on experience, label things, solidify things in two, terms of twofold ego, um, again, grasping and fixation. And instead we're talking about this, that the sense uh, processes could come and go like anything else in our state of being. But when we do capture and when we do uh, attempt to hold on and store things up, he says that is what's called samsara. We just take in and churn out, take in and churn out. And he says this is like pissing on the ground so that it goes into the rivers and we end up drinking our own urine. Which again, I think also, um, if you think back to what we studied Kunzup, he talked about the incestuous quality of Kunzup and how things just become um, put together in, uh, in really neurotic ways. In contrast to this, he says the experience of prajna is fresh. It occurs and it has happened and that's it. It's like the Vajrayana concept of nowness. Nowness is like getting fresh banknotes and spending them on the spot. So in this case, we're being told not to fixate, not to grasp, not to hold on, and that the experience of prajna is our ability to recognize that we could let go. He says cognition goes beyond the level of the alaya vijnana, which again is the storehouse consciousness, the eighth consciousness, unconsciousness, where habitual patterns, karmic seeds are stored, or the alaya conscious, consciousness. It is just seeing. And he says that seeing is not necessarily visual alone. It's any first beam that projects out, be it vision, hearing, touch, or whatever. So very much on the level of first thought before there's any kind of attempt to um, label, grasp, hold on to any kind of experience. And he further says that cognition could accommodate anything. It's, he's, it's, he says it's somewhat related to recognition or recognition, I guess, as if you've seen your own nature before. And the idea here is that we recognize, when, again, we know that there's a difference between when we're awake and when we're distracted, when we're preoccupied, just as we do when um, in, the, in the practice of meditation, when we um, have a moment and realize that we've become distracted or preoccupied. In that very moment, we're back in awareness, and we know what that is. It's... Um, it's like meeting an old friend who we recognize right away because we're, we just know. He says, in this place, cognition is the subject and knowledge is the, is the object. Actually, this came up. I uh, reread the um, 1982 seminary transcript talk on Prajna. And uh, some of what he says in this section actually comes out of the questions and answers. So I actually want to read the actual question and answer. It was not part of the talk itself, but it was actually in response to a question. I guess my question is, how do we re relate to this in terms of our own experience? And with this, Trungpa Rinpoche answers, well, I think that is the question, definitely. You see, there are two ways of learning. One is collecting information, trying to understand that information, and store it in your memory bank and in your notebook. In understanding, in understanding shunyata, this kind of learning is not ap applicable. It is simple. Either it could be a one-shot deal, or it could be multiple shots. Nonetheless, this is a situation where you try to understand why this is the case. 
you can actually come to the logical conclusion that everything is non-existent. You can definitely do that. Then having understood that, you wouldn't dwell on that understanding. You could just see the fact and after understanding that, then you would begin to absorb that understanding into your whole being, if there's any being left at that point. So what he's talking about, I think, is that we, again, we have these moments of insight, these moments of clarity, but it's important that we don't possess or hold on to them, that we continue resting in the state of knowing rather than getting fixated on what's known. Um, he says the basis of prajna, to continue with the chapter, he says the basis of prajna is that you're fully trained in the practice of sitting meditation. Inspired by shamatha and vipassana, you are able to develop wonderful paramitas. And with prajna, you are actually able to put them into effect. Prajna shows you how to develop ideal compassion that is sharp and precise. He also says that prajna is said to be the medicine that will free us from the sickness of the two veils that prevent us from going beyond samsaric bondage, which are conflicting emotions and primitive beliefs about reality. So conflicting emotions refers to the kleshas, uh, primarily passion, aggression, and ignorance, but there's all kinds of secondary kleshas that develop out of passion, aggression, and ignorance, like resentment, jealousy, and so on and so forth. And we begin to see through all of that with prajna. Prajna cuts through that. And primitive beliefs refers to um, what we um, spoke about in the chapters on um, emptiness before, the beliefs in eternalism, in other words, attaching some kind of solid, permanent, ongoing identity to ourselves and to things in the world around us. Uh, and it's opposite nihilism, that nothing exists. And um, so basically, Prajna cuts through both nihilism and eternalism. He says with Prajna, the way to relate to the world and with obstacles is to view them as temporary fever or flu. So the idea is that whatever obstacles we experience, they're not fundamental to our being. Our, uh, our basic being is basically good. Our being is basically Buddha nature, bodhicitta. And whatever obstacles develop are secondary to that or obscurations on top of that. But with prajna, we can be free of them, just like um, washing off something from a dish that's become dirty and then it's clean again. So the idea is that obstacles are temporary that it's, um, and we can see that with prajna. The next section was skillful, skillful means in prajna. The skillful means um, refers to the first five paramitas, generosity, discipline, patience, ex uh, exertion, and meditation. And he says prajna cannot develop without the rest of the paramitas, they work together. The first pa five paramitas are known as upaya or skillful means, but skillful means also, also need wisdom or prajna. By joining skillful means and upaya, prajna and upaya, uh, sorry, by joining prajna and upaya, <laughs> Mahayana is superior to the Hinayana. He says prajna is connected with the feminine principle and upaya with the masculine principle. But at this point, it's prajna that makes the uh, other paramitas transcendent actions, ones that transcend the actions of ego. It's prajna that allows us to, um, for instance, practice the threefold purity of no giver, no gift, and no recipient with generosity. Or it's prajna that, for instance, in regard to uh, discipline and patience, uh, might allow us to see that someone else's aggression is actually coming out of their own pain and allow us to um, respond to them in a way that uh, is compassionate rather than reactive and aggressive in response to their aggression. So again, it's prajna that really brings to life, you could say, or brings to full completion uh, the, uh, the, the paramitas. At the same time, is this the paramitas that ultimately allow us to develop passion, uh, compassion, uh, prajna. Slow down a second. Um, so the idea is you could say that the paramitas are recursive. The five paramitas help us develop prajna, but then also prajna feeds back into the five paramita, the other five paramitas, and kind of brings them, brings them to fully to life. He says prajna is sharpness. It is said to be very precise and clear. Prajna has passion and directness, and upaya has the resources to work with prajna. And then he says upaya without prajna would be ineffective, like the sun without rays. 
He says that the first five paramitas, again, generosity, generosity, discipline, patience, exertion, and meditation, free us from the samsaric world, but they can never enable us to go beyond the tr transcendent world. The Mahayana concept is not to dwell in either the samsaric or the transcendent world, or in other words, not to dwell in either um, samsara or nirvana. He says you have to go beyond both nirvana and samsara to be a benefit to others. He also, another metaphor for the, uh, or analogy for the, um, the paramitas is that prajna is the ocean to which the rivers of the five paramitas flow. Without prajna, he says, it's impossible to attain enlightenment because you have no way of viewing your journey, no way of looking at your path. You'd be like a blind person trying to enter a big city. So you start with skillful means, generosity, discipline, patience, exertion, and meditation. Practice those as they're given to you. And then you begin a big reviewing process. You question what you're doing with all of these. In doing so, you're developing prajna, which allows you to look back at the whole thing properly. Practice first, then you figure out what you're doing afterward. And in this regard, there's a, um, a, just a, a couple of sentences, again, from the seminary transcript that I don't think were in this talk, but I think that are interesting in regard to what he says about this reviewing process. And I think they also speak to the inquisitive nature of prajna as well. He said that prajna is discriminating awareness wisdom, which can discriminate every detail and particle of the world's existence because the process and processor are never stuck in any one biased state of existence at all. Therefore, because there is no doer and nothing is being done, you're able to examine and look through the entire world. And therefore, you can do the best research of all. In the next section, he talks about prajna and shunyata. And he says, prajna has allegiance to shunyata or emptiness. In fact, he says, without that connection with shunyata, it would be completely overwhelming if there are too many clear perceptions. But clear perception qualified by emptiness is stable. So shunyata is as solid as much as it is empty. In other words, um, it's the recognition of shunyata that it gives us the stability to be able to work with all the things that we perceive in the world around us. In understanding shunyata, he says, intellectual learning is not applicable. Um, although we could come to, you could try to understand shunyata logically and come to the conclusion that everything is non-existent, but then you don't dwell on that understanding as we talked about before. Um, he continues to say that at this point, um, loneliness might be a beacon that points in the direction and, we, and you can explore further. You ask basic questions such as who am I or does this have substance? You begin to look for real substance, not just something imaginative. So this experience of shunyata opens up all kinds of questions. The teachings, he says, the teachings only go so far and then it's up to you to figure it out. For instance, if you know about shamatha vipassana but you continue to choose fixation, you could ask yourself why, which is certainly a good thing to contemplate. This is, he says, this is called the study of Buddhism. Somebody gives you a clue. This is the world. This is you. This is what to do and what not to do. And then you need to do it and find out for yourself. If you do, you'll come to a conclusion that's no different from what the Buddha found. He says, everyone comes to the same conclusion, but from different directions and in different ways. So the question is the answer. Again, with Prajna, we're really learning to experience fully the knowing and inquisitive quality of our mind so that we are open to uh, the full range of our experience. He goes on to say that regarding shunyata, you might think that finding yourself non-existent is a source of panic, but it's actually a source of joy. And he tells us why. He gives us some reasons. He says, because you do not have to maintain yourself, in other words, because we're free of ego, free of um, confusion, free of the kleshas, free of struggle. There's less struggle and hardship. And also there's no need to keep this and that going. So again, referring to twofold ego, ego of self or ego of individuality, as well as ego of dharmas or ego of other. 
nobody has to synchronize these two worlds. And that is what we, we no longer need to synchronize the two worlds of this and that, which is what we usually do. So he says, shunyata is an open world. It is empty yet joyful. At a certain stage, he says, non-reference point is the reference point. This is why we call it brilliance or luminosity. But it's not solid, which is why you have to go through training and do practices. Again, what we talked about in the beginning, that prajna is something we need to work with, we need to cultivate. Because otherwise, we tend to solidify and grasp. He says, in our tradition, we do not believe in sudden realization. Nobody can be enlightened all that suddenly. He says, sudden realization is more like a password or initial behavior pattern. And after that, you go on a journey. You keep going with non-reference point. There are more subtleties than just becoming enlightened in one go. So finally, uh, the next section was titled Discriminating Awareness Wisdom which is another definition of prajna. He says, discriminating awareness means that you're able to separate dharmas. And again, we've actually um, experienced this and talked about this previously because it's very much part of the Hinayana as well, that we're able to, for instance, look at the five skandhas and see how what seems to be a solid thing, this solid ego is actually made up of a lot of different parts, a lot of different processes, you could say. Uh, we learn to as well begin to look at the world and see that the world uh, is um, completely interdependent, that um, things come, come together and come apart constantly in the world around us as well. So again, this ability to discriminate clearly. He says the opposite of prajna is being unable to experience precision. It's being ignorant and wallow, wallowing in confusion. Discriminating, he says, in this context, does not take sides. It's not like you like something and accept it or that you dislike something and reject it. Instead, discriminating here, he says, refers to having tremendous precision. So again, this is something that we begin to develop in shamatha practice, just learning to settle and look at each moment, moment to moment. Uh, be present, clear, and free from preconceptions. So discrimination refers to having tremendous precision and being able to see the sharp edges of situations. And he says that although you do not take sides, you still have a sense of what is what, which is which, when is when. Um, earlier in the chapter, he said that sharap or prajna means being able to discriminate light from dark, purple from yellow. It's like being able to discriminate sharp from dull, awake from asleep happy from sad. When you begin to, he then says, when you begin to work with your body and mind with proper posture in the sitting practice of meditation. So again, we're back to the importance of shamatha and vipassana in terms of developing prajna. And again, remember that the five paramitas up to prajna are also expressions of shamatha vipassana, meditation and action. Anyway, it, you, when you begin to work with your body and mind with proper posture and the sitting practice of meditation, you begin to act like a prajna person. You begin to distinguish between confusion and direct perception. In meditation, you begin with the first and closest thing to work with, which is the breath. You learn that certain things could be accepted and included as part of the practice and certain things rejected. Through that kind of precision and directness, you're developing prajna as a contemplative technique. It goes on to say, as you practice meditation, your prajna begins to be sharpened. You're able to distinguish one dharma from another. You be your prajna begins to distinguish prajna from non-prajna. You find that when you develop mindfulness fully and properly, looking at the sun is brighter, food is much tasty. And this is because we're beginning to discriminate between being caught up in distraction, caught up in a dream, in a trance, preoccupied, as opposed to simply being present with our experience um, and allowing experience to be just as it is. So that there's less conceptual filtering and less reference to the past so that, and more freshness in the present moment. He says, you begin to realize that thing, things have sharpened as a result of your mindfulness practice. You begin to feel free of forgetfulness because in dealing with the present, you experience the past as vivid and the future as clear. So again, it comes back to the sense of discrimination or separating dharmas in terms of being very clear about what's past, what's present, and what's future. 
which much of the time we're quite confused about. Because of that, the present situation has no fear. You have a perfect idea of how your future is going to be. I like this part. You know your house is going to fall apart and all the systems are going to break down. You know it's either going to be sold or become part of the landscape. So it's interesting that he says this is without fear. But in any case, I think the point here is that we um, don't take things to be as solid as um, we ordinarily do. We don't, um, we recognize the truth of impermanence. Um, we don't project identity or substance onto things. And we realize that um, things are subject to change. So in that sense, we're a much clearer view of the future than we do when we're caught up in wishful thinking um, or some kind of ignorant denial about the reality of things. The final section that I'll be talking about is titled The Sword of Prajna. And the analogy of a sword is quite, uh, you know, he's quite frequently in regard to prajna because of the cutting action of a sword. He says, prajna enables you to cut through your early clashes, which are known as mental events. With a tremendous sense of mindfulness, you begin to develop awareness as well. So again, in the beginning, we're just cutting through klesha. We're learning to come back uh, and not, or at least, uh, allowing ourselves not to be swept away by our experience of, in, you know, in the passion, aggression, and ignorance. And as the mind settles, we begin to um, develop awareness as well, the clarity that is, you know, my, that which we experience as mind settles. Um, at the Vipassana level, which is what we're talking about with awareness, you acquire further knowledge so that in case your sword is corrupted, you know how to sharpen it again. And to explain this, we experience this very simply in meditation practice. We um, become present, then we get distracted. And it's Vipassana awareness that helps bring us back at that point so that our sword doesn't get too dull. He goes on to say the blade of this particular sword has two edges. It cuts both yourself and other. You can cut the frigidity and fickleness of your own existence, the sense of individuality that you hold so dear, this cherished I, the ego. You cut it to the core, not in suicidal terms, but, in, but from the point of view of delight. Impurity has been purified. And then, so that's one aspect of the, the blade, of the sword of prajna. It cuts through the ego of individuality, the ego of self. And then he says, having struck with one side of the blade, we strike in the other direction. We begin to realize that the outside world we're creating is precisely the same as that which we create in ourselves. In other words, we come to recognize that just as egolessness is our true state, so too is the egolessness of dharmas, the egolessness of other, the egolessness of the world around us. So prajna cuts through both. Having cut both ways, we experience shunyata, which he says is the absence of random labeling and samsaric perception or kuntak, which we talked about in previous chapter. We find that we're without kuntak or false conceptions, no kuntak here, no kuntak there, no kuntak everywhere. Um, and just for reference, I actually looked up the uh, chapter on kuntak, and I'll just read two sentences from that to help with the definition of it. He says, we apply kuntak by attaching ourselves to a certain idea and then trying to perpetuate it so that the world will appear the way we want it. Things are just a fabricate, then things are just a fabrication of reality rather than actual reality. So the sword of prajna cuts both ways. And rather than dealing with the fabrication of reality, we end up working with, looking at, being in actual reality. Then the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to um, John for the remainder of the chapter is just a little piece that actually comes from the um, Hinayana text, The Path of Individual Liberation, because the last three chapters in there also deal with prajna. And what he says in the, the final chapter, which was titled Taking the Teachings to Heart, which is worth multiple readings, is Prajna wakes you up and makes you more open and fascinated in the right sense. Rather than being based on intrigue, greed, or the desire to make yourself comfortable, this fascination is based on first thought, best thought. With Prajna, your vision begins to expand, not through struggling or feeling that you ought to expand your vision but through a natural sense of connection with the world around you. With Prajna, the teachings of the Buddha become a natural part of you, as if the Buddha were talking in your brain. So with that, I'll turn it over to John. And... Thank you, Michael. 
I hope people are not going to be disappointed. But listening to Michael, there was so much in this first half of the chapter that I think what I'd like to do is to do the second half next week and give you a chance to uh, review the whole chapter. I think this is perhaps one of the most profound chapters that we've, maybe the most profound and difficult uh, chapter that we've read so far. And um, I think um, we should take it more slowly than was originally planned. So what I'd like to do is briefly just go over some of the points in the first half of the chapter to help reinforce them and leave the second half and Michael and I can do that next week if, he, if Michael wants to uh, propose this to him. I'm just, I'm just saying I listened to this and it's so much material. It's so overwhelming, I think, in its profundity and de depth. That's what's prompting this. It's somewhat unusual. I want to talk a little bit about Prajna. Actually, <clears throat> Dugo Kensei Rinpoche, a great teacher in the, uh, who died in the early 1990s, um, he was perhaps regarded by all sects of Tibetan Buddhism as the greatest teacher at that time, maybe. He once talked about Trungpa Rinpoche, I've got a quote somewhere that someone sent me, that he taught the backwards path of Ati. Ati is the um, ultimate teaching in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. It's the last ultimate stage of the path. And um, Trungpa Rinpoche really introduced his students to this without naming it that from the beginning. And then he sort of went back and filled in the blanks, but always from that Ati perspective. This talk on Prajna is very much a talk from the Ati perspective. I think that um, for those of you who have studied uh, Ati at all, like I know uh, Michael, perhaps and others, we could be uh, substituting the word Rigpa for Prajna here. Rigpa is the ultimate wisdom, the ultimate knowledge. But let's just stay with Prajna, the way he's defined it. And really what it is amounts to is this, and I'm going to the Dzogchen, the Ati um, explanation, because it so fits the material that he presented here. That we fundamentally have two modalities of mind, two modalities of knowing. One is called, we're calling it here, prajna. In the Dzogchen, the great perfection tradition, the last stage of the path, they call it ritpa. Ritpa is the word means, it's the Tibetan word for vidya. It just means seeing or knowing. The other modality is what in the Dzogchen tradition is called in the Tibetan sem. In the Sanskrit chitta. And what that refers to is thinking mind, the mind that thinks about this and that, about me and other, about my relationships, about what I'm going to have for lunch, about how I slept last night, about what I'm afraid of, what I'm hoping for. All these thoughts are what constitute sem, ordinary mind. It's usually translated in uh, by the Nyingmas. Gets a little confusing. There's another term, ordinary mind, that's translated by the Kagyus and it has a very different meaning. So we'll just call it thinking mind. But it's the mind of every day. It's the mind that we walk around with as we live our lives. We think, get up in the morning, we think, what do I have for breakfast? What do I need to do today? And we make lists and we tell ourselves words and we have images in our thinking mind. This is not prajna. What prajna is, is let's everybody just sit for a second. Take a posture. Take a good meditation posture. With your eyes open. 
and you're looking probably at the screen or you might be looking down at your desk doesn't really matter whatever meets the eye is clear that visual image is unstoppable with your eyes open these sounds these words are unstoppable because your ears are open now that i mention it the feeling of your body on whatever you're sitting is clear there present effortlessly you don't have to try you don't have to try and figure something out it presents itself this is called the information of the ayatanas, which really means the informations of the senses. Likewise, now that I mention it, those of you are having, who are having thoughts, you can see your thoughts. You can see that you are having a thought or an awareness. That's another clear, effortless object of mind when you're not lost in the thought, when you just see that you're having the thought or the emotion whatever the emotion might be. It might be one of curiosity. It might be one of frustration. It might be one of boredom. Who knows? Whatever those emotions or thoughts are, all of these things arise in awareness, effortlessly, including this sound of this voice that's being projected, the images that you're looking at on your screen. This is really what's meant by prajna, that clear, unstoppable, always with us, awareness of something. And what it's aware of are the six knowables, sights, sounds, the occasional smell, taste, bodily sensation, and the mental events. These things arise in awareness unstoppably. And this, you might say, is prajna. The awareness that sees these things with no effort at all. And then we get lost in thought. I tell you, calculate for me the product of 17 times 28. And you start thinking, 17 times 28, well, 10 times 28 is 280. 7 times 20 is 140. 7 times 8 is 56. How do I add these together? And you're thinking, 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 thinking. I might say to you, what did you have for dinner? And you start remembering, oh, you know, I had chicken. Oh, I had beans. Oh, you know, and those thoughts and those images come into your mind. We get lost in those thoughts. That's what's called sem or chitta is being lost in the world of thought, of mental events, as opposed to this clarity when we come back and we just effortlessly see whatever is being presented in the present moment. That is what is being referred to here as prajna. So there is always these two aspects going on in our minds. The clarity, the effortlessness, the unstoppable quality of prajna. And then these mental events that we get lost in, the dreams, oh, that person shouldn't have said that to me. What am I going to do about this? You know, I'm not making enough money. I better work harder or whatever, whatever it might be. We get lost in the dreams. This are the two, these are the two modalities. And this is what he is talking about here. Prajna, clear perception, he calls it, of the phenomenal world, he says. It's superior knowing. It's, why is it superior? Because it's not clouded with all of the prejudices, the judgments of our thoughts. We've learned things from our mommy, from our daddy, from our experiences about what's good and what's bad. And we carry these ideas, these prejudices with us all the time and we see the world through the veil of these thoughts. You see someone walking down the street who reminds you of your wonderful mother and you immediately you start feeling affection for this stranger or vice versa. You see someone walking down the street towards you who reminds you of your terrible mother, your angry mother, and you immediately feel, have feelings of antipathy. We're constantly seeing the world through the veil 
of our thoughts. Prajna is coming back into clear awareness, letting go of those thoughts, clearing them, and seeing just the naked event as it is. This is why Prajna is superior seeing. It's not clouded by the, the prejudices, by the judgments of our thoughts, by the hopes and fears that drive our thoughts, the anxieties, it, all of that is gone. It's just clear knowing of whatever is happening to arise in the present moment. Our loyalty is very much to our thoughts. Our allegiance is to our thoughts, our worries, our hopes, our loves, our hatreds. And these drive us. And what this path is about is about switching one's loyalty from all of the judgments of thought to the clear appreciation and intelligence of Prajna. Seeing with the eyes of Prajna, one begins to enter into the world of reality, which only lives in this present moment. This is the world which is called Shunyata. Shunyata means emptiness, voidness. What is it empty of? It's empty of the polarities, of the good and bad, of the all these judgments that live in thought. It's empty of that. And being empty of that, it is very, very vivid. Because those thoughts cloud our view. When you're lost in thought, you're barely here. If you're really, really lost in some thought, it might be some anxious, angry, or hopeful thought, someone might call your name and you didn't even hear them because you were so lost in thought, even though they were standing a few feet away. Our thoughts cloud our perception. They take us away into dream. Prajna brings us back into this present moment, into this world which is empty, fundamentally empty of dream as it arises now. It's just this. And as it arises now, it arises with extraordinary vividness, a kind of beauty in that vividness. And this is what he refers to right at the end of Michael's uh, teaching. This luminosity. This is the luminosity of shunyata. Because being empty of neurosis, being empty of the tension of thought, having that gone, this world is seen much more clearly, vividly. You've all experienced this. I remember it was a child walking down the stairs at somebody's house, and there was a window on the landing. And as I passed through it, there were motes of dust and sunlight coming in, and I was startled by the brilliance and the beauty of it. We all have had moments like this in our lives, more and less, each one of us. This is what Prajna reveals. And it reveals it by cutting through the neurotic thoughts. And there are two aspects to those thoughts. This is why the sword of Prajna is, has two blades. It's a two-bladed sword. You can talk about it as cutting through beliefs in me, about me, the self-obsession with me. That clouds your thoughts a lot, as well as cutting through the thoughts about other, all those others out there. The two go together completely. And this is what we're going to talk about in the second half of this chapter. As long as you can believe in yourself, Hey, Kristen. 
as long as you believe in in this I, and you keep talking about one one talks to, to oneself about I, I and my problems, I and my hopes, I and my virtues, I and my love, I and my am I am I loved? All of these things, I, I, I. Then there has to be an other, because that's how we constantly reaffirm the existence, whether it's happy or unhappy, of I, by relating to others. If that's out there, then I'm here. If I'm here, then I need things to relate to, things to do. So I and other are just two, two poles in the same neurotic thought pattern. I love so-and-so. I love roast beef. I love <laughs> sunny days. Um, there's always the I and the other. I hate this. I'm jealous of that. I'm envious of this other thing. And there's always these two poles. So the sword of Prajna has to cut two ways. And we're going to be getting into that a lot more in the second half of this chapter and how that works and what liberation is. He says, with prajna, the way to relate with the world and with ourselves, that's the two poles, me and other, when we experience obstacles, when we experience all kinds of, you know, um, terrible emotional upheavals, let's say, is to regard them as a temporary fever or flu. They're not real. They're not permanent. They are temporary flus. <laughs> what about that? You're angry at somebody. It's a flu. You know, you're in love with somebody. They gave you help. It's a flu. It's a temporary fever or flu, he says. And then the nature of prajna is that it has allegiance to shunyata, to emptiness. The two go together. You can't have emptiness without prajna. And when you have prajna, it brings the emptiness because it brings the absence of the neurosis. And you begin to see voidness. Voidness of what? Voidness of neuroticism. He says the solidity, the stability of shunyata, that qual it qualifies prajna. If you want to know prajna, you need to understand shunyata. And many of us have had glimpses of shunyata, not really knowing what it was. Some gap in neurotic mind where the world appeared very clearly, vividly, as it is. Beyond our preconceptions, beyond our judgments, with a kind of sharpness and immediacy. And that is enabled, that's the union, you might say, of shunyata and prajna. What else is there to say about this? Michael said it all. I'm just, I'm trying to reinforce it a bit because it is so difficult and important. These two modalities, ordinary mind, sem, full of thought, thinking, and this clarity that is always with us. It's just that we don't pay attention to it. We're so lost in the thoughts. But it's always here. It's like the sky and clouds. You always have the sky. Clouds just go across it. We always have prajna. It's what we are. And then thoughts, confusions, hopes and fears of all kinds go across that sky. And we notice them. We give our loyalty to the figure. And we, we uh, what's the word? Um, don't pay attention to the ground. The ground is this clear, ongoing, unstoppable, ever-present clarity, awareness of one thing or another, of a sight, a sound, a smell, a touch, 
a bodily sensation or a mental event. You can't stop it. But then we get stuck in this thought, what am I going to do about so-and-so? Some worry, some hope. And we forget this ground of our being. He says, at a certain stage, non-reference point, that means giving up I and other, giving up the thoughts, those plans, those, those dramas. Thought is always, always about drama. A drama involving me and the world, me and other. <laughs> it's the old drama, you know. Um, She's tied to the train tracks. The train is coming. Will she be saved? We're living this out in so many ways all throughout our days. These are the reference points, the train, the tra railroad tracks, the heroine tied, the hero on his way. And he says at a certain stage, non-reference point is the reference point. That means that you begin to shift your loyalty to this open, clear dimension. And that's why we call it brilliance or luminosity, because we are no longer obsessed with our thoughts. Here, he finally, I'm just going to, these are some things that I highlighted in this chapter. He says, it is about having tremendous precision. This is Prajna. Everything is bright and beautiful, and you know what is what. He hasn't talked about. There can be fear on the part of Sem, thinking mind, because you're giving it up. Because you're giving up reference points, knowing who you are and where you're going. And you're really coming back and floating free in this present moment, which never ends. It never ends. And we're beginning to let go and float free in that. And there can be a fear that neurotic mind throws up as a defense, you might say. But the beauty of shunyata constantly, as it becomes more and more apparent becomes more and more seductive. Proper posture in the sitting practice of meditation. Michael read this quote. You begin to act like a prajna person. You begin to distinguish between confusion and direct precision. Isn't that wonderful that our posture can become a reminder of this clarity of mind. It can bring us back to sanity this intimate connection between body and mind. Trungpa Rinpoche emphasized that so much. He called it having good head and shoulders, he said. <laughs> he taught it, talked about it as synchronizing body and mind. That can only happen when you come into prajna. He says, your senses are heightened with prajna. Things have sharpened as a result of the mindfulness practice. Mindfulness means when we sit and meditate, we're coming back into prajna again and again. Oh, I was thinking, I'm back. There's the breath going out. Here's space. And we come back for a moment, for an instant. Maybe it's still clouded by a little bit of self-consciousness, but that's wearing out. So we talked about the two two full clue edges, couldn't talk. And I'm gonna stop there. I think this is a lot, a lot to work with. And it's so important. It's really the very core of our practice. When you talk about being a Buddhist, what it means fundamentally is coming back into the world of emptiness, of shunyata, of prajna, and then we're going to get to it, of compassion. 
and of acting skillfully for the benefit of ourselves and others. All that rests on this shifting of our allegiance from neurotic mind, the mind of self-aggrandizement and self-protection and fear and depression to the mind, the aspect of, Shin, of Prajna, clear seeing, the background. Jim Rinpoche said once, he said, um, we have, how did he put it? The gist of it was that we've become fixated on the figure and we have lost the ground. We are thinking, thinking about this, the thought, and we are losing that unstoppable ongoing awareness of everything that is Prajna, that never ends. It's like we're swimming in it. It's everywhere. It's, it's four-dimensional, space and time. But we get caught up in sin, thinking. It's quite something to shift one's allegiance. It's a very different world, the world of Shunyata. After we finish this chapter next week, we're going to go into the Lojong slogans, which are all about how to actualize this, because <laughs> this is all very theoretical. And basically, you can actualize it in two ways, through meditation practice, and that's one way, and the other way is through study and contemplation, which keys your intelligence. So we could have a discussion. Dan. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Well, not quick. Um, the question is quick. Would you say that uh, Rigpa, or as I learned the translation, the nature of mind and shunyata are indistinguishable, emptiness? Um, it's like the, you know, that old, um, trope to right. blind men and the elephant oh. and um, one of them feels the leg of the elephant and says oh the elephant's like a tree and the other one feels the side of the elephant and says no 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 it's like a house it's like you know another one feels the trunk and he says oh it's like a snake these are all different aspects words for different aspects of reality shunyata prajna rigpa I'm, I'm, if, if there are other descriptions of prajna that won't sound like as much like Rigpa. Trumpa Rinpoche is, <laughs> he's just, he's giving us the, the end of the path at the beginning. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, prajna is very close, mm. but it's not quite as pure as it is presented here. Right. And by other people, when it's presented yeah. by other people. I, I, um, it, is it, I guess what I'm, maybe another way of putting what I'm saying is emptiness, the shunyata, is that the, is there any difference between that and resting in just this type of knowledge, prajna, prajna? I mean, if you're truly, whatever you want to call it, attaining prajna, <laughs> is it the same as just as experiencing it? Emptiness. It's, it's the problem with words. Emptiness yeah. is about the um, reality that we inhabit. Prajna is about the faculty that sees it. Right. Okay. Right. The two are almost, in, in, really, they're indistinguishable. Got it. They're just, they're just the different aspects of the same thing. Right. Shunyata is usually defined as the non-existence you know, of I, a self and of other, that these are myths, that these are mental fabrications and that they have no true existence at all. And that they involve us once we once we do think that they have true existence, then we are lost and involved in confusion. And the confusion is in the relationship 
between I and other, which is always past and future oriented. Emptiness is freedom from that. Freedom how? You come back into the present moment. I and other are not part of reality. Mm. They are fictions. And you see it all through the I, E-Y-E, of Prajna. Right, right. Got it. Lipa, you want to call it that? Yeah, just, I think I understand. Thanks. Just to take what John said a, a somewhat different direction, uh, but what he said about the problem with language, I think if we start thinking of ourselves as a possessor of either one, shunyata or prajna, then we, we're dealing with a concept of some kind or two concepts. And it's it, they're both really beyond concept. This is shunyata. I mean, prajna cuts concept and shunyata is beyond. We can kind of point at it. But um, to think of it as something we could possess is, or grasp is um, going to lead us astray. Right. It's what they call expressing the inexpressible. Exactly. Right. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, words are, I mean, our, our experience is fundamentally beyond words because it's so vivid and real. But words are partial pointers to our experience. This page of paper. Mm -hmm those words, but then there's the reality of it, which is so vivid and immediate. And so in the teachings, they call words tags. It's like you take a tag and you write the word paper on it and scotch tape it to the, <laughs> to the thing. <laughs> That's what words are. And, uh, and they also call words just useful ways to take things, mm -hmm. but not really real useful at a particular time, place, for a particular person. Rick has his hand up. Thank you, Rick. So does Philip. Yep, Rick and then Philip. Uh, yes, I've been, this has to do with uh, words, which I'm, I have a pretty deep sense of the problems with words, but in the, the talk of the present moment or just this, and the emphasis on the ground, uh, and sometimes it seems as if there can be a kind of sterilization there and, and you get it with the self and other. Uh, uh, awareness can be one of the uh, six uh, things, uh, uh, thoughts even or sensations, but I am aware that there are people in Lexington tonight in danger of being evicted as well as homeless people who may not be able to find shelter in this cold weather. Now, first of all, I have just referred to other entities, those people. Now, does that get into a problem that I am thereby creating a me, and this is off ground, you know, this is a problem? Um, and, and, you know, in general, clearly with the compassion and the whole drift of the teaching, you want to end up trying to help people. So I, I, I'm a little perplexed. And again, when in the spinning of words, uh, the relations of, of the, the just this or the present moment can't be sort of, is, is at the same time as the best ground, it can't be sort of a sanitized thing in a jar protected from or cut off from actual experience in the world. Michael, you want to address it or shall I? I'm thinking about it a little bit. I mean, in one sense, I think what maybe partly what you're talking about is the danger of nihilism, uh, of saying that uh, because things are empty and don't have substance, then nothing matters, which is also um, an extreme belief that Prajna cuts through. So, um, regardless of how well or poorly we might understand ultimate truth, we still have to deal with relative truth and that beings do suffer and that that um, is a meaningful experience. It's not, Sunyata doesn't mean that nothing's there. It does mean that things are there that in a different way than how we conventionally take them. Um, you know, and you know, so for that reason, that's why um, compassion on a relative level is, and an ultimate level, is so important. I'll let John take it from there. That's my stab at it. Thank you. 
I think um, the neurotic mind, the thinking mind, is very much involved with I. The open mind of shunyata is just dealing with what is real in the present moment. And it's much more available that then one becomes, if, if you can even talk about one, much more available to re respond to the needs of the world. And that's why shunyata is so linked with compassion, true compassion, not a feeling sorry for, but an open responsiveness of heart to the needs of this world, to the beauty of this world, with its pain and its pleasure. And so the bodhisattva, the person who lives in this world of shunyata and prajna, is much more responsive, kind, open, um, to the needs around him or her. So I don't think, I, I agree with you, Rick, absolutely shunyata doesn't mean that we become solipsistic and self-absorbed cut off, quite the reverse. We become much more open, and they talk about the development of both compassion and what goes with that is skillful means. And what skillful means means is responsiveness, accurate responsiveness right. yeah. to the requirements of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's um, for example, though, in the phrase uh, like, it, there's only this moment. What? And then in the phrase, there's only this moment and that, that it's all started, it's over again and all that. There, I can see temptations. Again, it's a matter of the words that to cut this off from, you know, the, the suffering on the street. This, word, this, this moment now contains the past and the future. We all got to this place from the past and we're all going to go to bed in the future <laughs> it's all here in the moment as well as everything that's happening around us the suffering and needs of this world yeah no at the stay so thank you thank you philip so uh, thank you john and michael for your teaching and and rick for your very good question and I'd like to get back to that with skillful means, but even more, I'd like to get back to what Dan was talking about. And this may uh, just break down again in terms of words, but isn't it true that when we meditate and we try to uh, just inhabit awareness, egoless awareness, isn't that shunyata? Isn't that what it's all about? Or isn't that the essence of mind? or any kind of words you want to put on it. My real question is if, unless I have a problem with, with, with those like preliminaries, on the bottom of 257, and Michael was talking about this, Rinpoche in trying to talk about uh, this is talking about cognition as um, prajna. And, and he's, he goes on at the bottom of the page to say, cognition goes beyond the level of alya vishnana or alya consciousness, and it does not stand the level of resting in alya, talking about it in the slogan sense, resting in alya. But isn't that what we're doing in meditation exactly is resting in alya? So it depends. It depends on you. <laughs> resting in alya uh, is not shunyata, um, but it's a way station, you might say, because we are stopping thought and we are, it's a kind of, there's a, the problem with alia, see the alia is this, what they call the storehouse consciousness. It's that sense of me back there that you can't quite access, but which kicks out all kinds of habits and thoughts. And, but there's this sense of I. And when we rest in the alia, we are sort of resting in that awareness of I which is a way station to shunyata. Teachers will say this. They'll say, don't worry about it if you're resting in alia. It leads, you know, as long as you keep at it, 
to shunyata because it's it takes effort you're constantly coming back to something that you're aware of and he's saying shunyata is not resting in alia which is right alia is still this fundamentally it's like it's like back there you know you, you've got this sense of i this i who's been around for decades you know and was a child at one point and will die tomorrow in some some future do you have anything michael i was actually looking ahead because <laughs> to see if i remembered the slogan exactly because i always remember it as resting in the nature of alia which is a little different than resting in alia hmm. um but actually in the in those slogans that we're about to read he actually talks about it as resting in ultimate bodhicitta so that <laughs> didn't help in that respect at least but Judy, um, Judy Leaf on the next page in her footnote um, talks about resting in Alia as exactly what you're describing Michael that slogan resting in the nature of Alia and my question I guess is is Alia that Alia different from Alia Vishnana yes yes uh, yeah yes this is a, a confusing point in the terminology there's the alia and there's the alia vijnana. The alia vijnana is the alia consciousness, and that's what I was talking about, resting in the alia. That's the eighth consciousness. It's still part of, of neurotic mind. Alia, stripped of that word vijnana, vijnana means consciousness, refers to the dharmadhatu. It's a, a synonym for the dharmadhatu. Dharmadhatu means the aspect of reality that in encompasses the space that encompasses all phenomena in which phenomena are continually arising and passing away so here Rinpoche is saying that cognition goes um it does not stay on that level of resting on alia that cognition and he's using cognition here for prashna is beyond that I think that's what John was trying to say when he was talking about Regpa as, you know, another, it's really, um, you know, kind of original mind, you could say, or, you know, um, before there's any kind of overlay of any kind, it's just pure cognition, pure knowing, pure seeing on that level. Whereas with the, especially with the Aliyah of Vijnana, you're already talking at the point where there's karmic seeds and, um, you know, the beginnings of, you know, the beginnings of ego. And Aliyah is something, something before that. But pure cognition, I think, is just Rigpa, is, is an, another good way to look at it. Just the pure, basic, awakened mind before any thought. Okay, thank you both very much. Yeah, there are these two confusing uses of the word alia. Alia by itself, when it refers to the absolute, one it's one version of the absolute, like shunyata is too. And then there's the alia vijnana, which is an aspect of confused mind. It's the eighth consciousness. So, so yeah, it's that confusion. Uh, if there's time, Mark Eskenazi. Right. Question. We do have time. Uh, hi. Um, I, I was just uh, thinking before about what we were talking about being in the moment and um, yet all the pain that's around us and how we respond to it. And um, it, it's interesting because you can get so wrapped up. But I think that what, what you were saying, John, about being doing things, being smart about the actions you do take. And you could do things in the moment for your, you know, th there's pain all around us. And if it's helping a neighbor who's just lost their wife, you know, making a meal or, uh, or, or writing a check, you know, to your uh, organization that's helping the homeless or people that are having difficulty, uh, these are all things you can do in the moment, but I do think there is a potential, you can get overwhelmed. I mean, we have a world now that it's not, you know, years ago, it was your neighbor. Now it's the world. I mean, <laughs> look at Afghanistan, what's going on there. I'm, 
we don't even want to think about it. It's horrible. And um, I think it's important to do what you can do and also not be drawn into the samsaric world of just being so involved with everything that you lose your mind. So uh, I don't know, that's, that's basically all I wanted to say is that we, we need to be in the moment and do things in the moment and, and be you know, helpful to others in the moment, but we also need to draw a line, in my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> I agree. I think it's important to be clear and realistic about what we can and can't do. And when we're not, we end up not being really of much help to anyone. Right. Well, I see no other hands raised. Anybody else before we, oh, Karen Sue, and then Meg. Okay, so see if you can follow me. When, John, when you were talking about the thinking mind and the, the we're thinking, 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 I had this, this awareness that when I, was lucky enough to travel and I'd go to this fabulous place and I'd look at the people who were traveling with me and they're all, they all have their phones or cameras up to their eyes and they're capturing one small portion of this amazing place that we're at. And that to me, um, was what came to me, John, when you were talking about the thinking mind, the thinking mind and, and not being grounded or aware of what's, what's really there. And it was just really just jumped right into my head. And I wanted to share that with you all. I hope you got that. <laughs> Thank you. I always thought a virtual reality existed when Trungpa Rinpoche was teaching. He would have used that as a wonderful metaphor for how we get lost. So Meg, you'll be the last. Um, you know, I can wait till tomorrow night and ask it then. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. So then we'll close. Sarah, do you want to do the, we'll dedicate the merit? This becomes more and more germane, don't you think? More and more important <laughs> to dedicate the merit. Um, here we go. And I'm going to mute all, I guess. By this merit, may all obtain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the rigged in's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful class. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks, Thank everybody. you, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks for dividing it, too, John. I think that was good. Gosh, that good job. Yeah. That was Prajna. <laughs> that, that, John, that was. It was Prajna. <laughs> You're muted, John. <laughs> Thank you. No project there. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to point that out. <laughs> Thank you. That was very kind of you. Very <laughs> right. Sure.
Yeah. That icon clouds it up, it obfuscates the clarity. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Yeah.